Look, I just want to, I'm going to introduce Howard, but, but first, if you don't mind, I'm just curious. How many of you in this room uh, were working before the credit crisis of 2008? Oh, well, pretty good number. Majority, I think. Majority, that's good. Okay. So you have a lot of perspective. Look, it, it really is my pleasure to introduce you to Howard Marks. Uh, Howard is a co-founder and um, co-chairman of Oak Tree, where he spends most of his time uh, determining, communicating regarding the firm's strategic posture. Um, in addition to founding and leading Oak Tree, he is extremely well known for his memos to Oak Tree clients. He's written uh, these memos for 33 years, mm -hmm. Howard. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. uh, and his book's The Most Important Thing in 2011 and um, Mastering the Market Cycle in 2018. And Howard, uh, I, I want you to know, I have been reading your memos for 20 years, mm -hmm. and please keep writing them. I, I really think they've made me a better investor, so thank, thank you. you for doing that. Thank you, Cyrus, you're very kind. Um, <clears throat> Howard holds a Bachelor of Science Economics degree, cum laude in finance, from the Wharton School, and an MBA in accounting and marketing from the Booth School of Business of the University of Chicago. He's a CFA charter holder, member of the investment committee of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, member of the investment committee of the Royal Drawing School in London, emeritus trustee of the University of Pennsylvania, where from 2000 to 2010 he chaired the investment board. And uh, Howard, uh, just because we started this conversation about your memos, I thought I would ask you some questions about a few of your more recent ones, sure. uh, illusion of knowledge, what really matters, and sea change. And then after I've asked my questions, um, uh, we'd be happy to take some questions from the floor. So let's start with the illusion of knowledge. Um, for, for this memo, you discussed macro forecasting. And for many years, you've expressed why you're not so interested in macro forecasts. So why is it so challenging for somebody to create a helpful macro forecast? First of all, when you say for many years, the, the f first memo was written in 1990. It was entitled uh, uh, The Route to Performance. The third memo was, I think, in 92, uh, as I recall. And the title was The Value of Predictions. So it's, it's, it's a recurring theme, nothing new. Uh, the title of the memo uh, the illusion of knowledge comes from the historian uh, Daniel Borston, who said that the enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, it's the illusion of knowledge. Uh, it, it, it's the belief that people know that keeps them from uh, exploration, which uh, ends in knowledge. Um, <clears throat> and maybe it's, uh, I guess that Mark Twain said it the same way, but a little more colloquially. He said, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble, it's what you know for certain that just ain't true. Um, and, uh, you know, <clears throat> look, how, I say in the memo that when I was a kid starting out at Citibank in the 70s, we used to talk about a lot about econometrics, which is something you don't hear much about anymore. But econometrics is the construction of a computer model which simulates the economy. All you have to do is provide the appropriate inputs, turn the crank, and you get a macro forecast. But how the hell could anybody build a model of an economy? There are, you know, there are billions of people in the world uh, creating uh, the economy, uh, thousands maybe millions of business entities, government entities, uh, and um, how can you model their behavior uh, without extremely simplifying assumptions which cripple the process? Um, how can you model not only how they're, not only the rational decisions they're gonna make about money, but how about their emotions and their swings of psychology? Um, and, uh, and, and, and what do you do about randomness, and luck, and chance, and exogenous influences, and weather, and, and all these things. 
and uh, so uh, you know it, when I was in school we used to talk about GIGO garbage in garbage out you make simplifying assumptions that are flawed you can't possibly have valid output so uh, that's not that's number one number two people have biases and our expectations our pronouncements about the future are usually very very um, much uh, clouded by our biases the greatest one of which is confirmation bias we hold a view about what the future holds we read something that agrees we say aha I'm right we read something that disagrees we throw it out <clears throat> disregard it and I mentioned in the in the memo that I read a book uh, last summer called mistakes were made but not by me uh, and and it's 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 on it's a good, very good book Carol Tavris and it's uh, it's on the subject of self-delusion and people receive information and that's how they dispose of it and and we have this thing called cognitive dissonance which permits us to live with uh, or deal with views that go against our own and <clears throat> I think that some of the great, greatest practitioners of cognitive dissonance uh, are the forecasters. And I say, you know, w w w again, early in my career, I heard the saying that an economist is, is like a portfolio manager who never marks to market. <coughs> and, and uh, you know, uh, it, it, when I go in to get business, I, Cyrus was talking about the, his, the great performance at Brookfield in private equity, 27% gross return over the whole life. Can you imagine if, if an economist went in for business and didn't give a track record? How do you get hired? Well, they still do, the answer is. Uh, you couldn't get hired without your track record. Uh, economists can. So for, for many, many, many reasons, uh, by the, and one of, the, uh, one of the things I say in there is that you look at the Fed. The Fed, I think, has between 200 and 400 PhD economists on the payroll. Not only can they not predict the economy, and by the way, they kind of lost it on transitory, but they can't even predict their own actions. If you read about what the Fed's going to do next year, they're usually wrong. So, um, you know, uh, perhaps John Kenneth Galbraith said it best. He said we have two kinds of forecasters, the ones who don't know and the ones who don't know they don't know. So, so Howard, uh, we've got a lot of investors here, um, uh, some relying on economic forecasts, I assume some not, but how should they go about their decision making? The, the, one of the most insightful questions that I get, and I've gotten it a few times since writing that memo, is you make investment decisions with, with regard to companies and properties based on forecasts of earnings, primarily. You, you know, there's a lot else, but it's subsumed under earnings, cash flow, and so forth. Don't you need a macro forecast to be able to predict earnings for a company? And, it's, it, it, and I say, aha, that's it. You got me. Because you do. Um, we have to make forecasts of earnings for companies, but we can't rely on macro forecasts is a great challenge. The answer is, in my opinion, that we make what I call neutral <coughs> forecasts with regard to the macro, which is essentially we predict that the macro will be like it always has been on average. Uh, I, I know that's probably wrong, but I don't think I can improve upon it. If I predict, uh, you know, the the, the U.S. economy's grown at a little under 2% a year for a long time now. I can predict three or I could predict one. I'm probably wrong. It's probably going to be two. Now, if I predict three and I'm right, I'm going to make more money than other people. If I predict one and I'm right, I'm going to make more money than other people. But most of the time, it's going to be two, and the predictions of one and three are going to be fruitless. So we make a neutral assumption. Um, and... Uh, uh, this is especially important, I think, if you look at a company or a property or an asset where the decision to buy it would have to be predicated on 
a, a, a non-neutral forecast, well, now you've bet your outcome on whether that non-neutral forecast is right. And we don't want to do that. We don't bet on forecasts. One of the, uh, we, Oak Tree runs according to a, uh, an investment philosophy which has six tenets, one of which is that our decisions are not predicated on macro forecasts. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I guess the one way to sum it up is, uh, you know, where are all the rich macro forecasters? And, uh, and uh, you know, we have, we have people who are, we have people who are famous for, for ver doing very good investing, you know, from Peter Lynch to Warren Buffett. And, and not only did they not get famous from macro forecasts, but they mostly rail against macro forecasts. And um, we don't have that many people who got famous for, mac for or rich uh, from macro forecasting. Howard, let's move on. Uh to the next memo, what really matters. And there, there are two uh, themes here that I think it would be really insightful for people to hear from you on. One, you talked about several things that shouldn't matter yeah. for investors, in particular short-term events. Right. I'd like you to touch on that. And then you also talked about uh, the perils of short-term trading right. compared to owning a I think what you said is owning a stake in a business, effectively. Yeah. But could you touch on those sure. concepts, please? First of all, before I do, let me just mention that uh, Cyrus has, has referred to these memos. Anybody can get them. They're all on the internet at oaktreecapital.com under the heading of insights, uh, going back to the beginning. And the price is right. They're free. Uh, so I, I hope you'll look. Uh, I, in particular, I hope you'll look at what really matters because I think it was one of the better ones and one of the more important ones. And it's one that I got almost no reaction to, uh, which happens a long time. By the way, I, I, in, from 1990 to, to 2000, for those 10 years, I never had one response. Not only did nobody ever say, that was great, which is what we live for, nobody ever said, I got it. Uh, and so one of the great mysteries is, is how I kept doing it. Uh, but anyway. Um, you know, we had, we had a conference in London on June 21st of last year for uh, our European and Middle Eastern uh, clients. And I kicked it off with the discussion of the environment and then took questions. And uh, then after lunch, I got back up and I said, and I unscheduled, and I said, you know what, I'm disappointed in the conversation of this morning. Because the only questions I got were, what will inflation be? How high will the Fed raise rates to uh, reduce inflation? Will it produce a recession? <clears throat> when, how bad, and how long? So inflation, rates, recession. These are not the things that matter. First of all, we can't know much about these things. Secondly, if we were going to uh, do anything about, if we formed views, we probably wouldn't do much about it. Because I've seen a lot of people discuss, uh, I've been on a lot of investment committees, uh, as, as you described, Cyrus, and they spend a lot of time discussing the macro forecast, but they don't make big changes in response to their conclusions, probably because they don't really believe uh, what, what they just agreed on. But... Um, you know, th these are not the things that matter. And what I said was, what we try to do <clears throat> is we try to invest in companies that will become more valuable over time and, and uh, debt instruments where the issuer will pay the interest in principal as scheduled. These are the things that matter. Uh, fundamentals. Fundamentals. And, you know, I, <clears throat> I describe in there uh, around... Uh, 2016, when, or late 15, 16, when the Fed started talking about raising rates. They kept, I, I believe that they kept rates way too low, way too long. And then they got into this bind where if they started talking about raising them, they had a revolution on their hands. But anyway, I went through a long period of time and the only question I got was when will the Fed start raising rates? And I say, I think I say in the memo, what does it matter? 
If I say March, what will you do? If I say, no, no, not March, May, what will you do different? <clears throat> you know? And it, it, it goes back to the illusion of knowledge. And by the way, one of the, one of the qu quotes in, in that memo, uh, somebody said, you know, if people understood how uncertain the world is, they wouldn't be able to get out of bed in the morning. And so they cloak themselves in forecasts to make the environment tolerable. And so, in early 2016, when will the Fed start raising rates seemed like an obvious question that one would like to have an answer to. But it, the, it doesn't deal with the question of, is it possible to obtain an answer to that question? And, and what would you do if you had the answer? Uh, you know, uh, uh, Warren Buffett uh, once said to me, as he said many times, that for a piece of information to be desirable, it has to satisfy two criteria. It has to be important, and the macro is extremely important. In fact, in the last 20, 25 years, it feels to me like it's the only thing people care about anymore. But it also has to be knowable. And I believe that the macro is not knowable in, in the sense that to be superior investors, all of us have to have an advantage what I call a knowledge advantage. We have to know something better than somebody else or clearly our investment performance will be average. But I don't think it's possible to know more than others about the macro. And consequently, I don't think that trading, which is in response to expectations regarding short-term events, I don't think it can be successful. And so I start the memo by saying, by talking about five things that I think don't matter. Short-term events, short-term trading, short-term performance, hyperactivity, and volatility. And, you know, volatility, I mean, we, first of all, m most people have subscribed to the view that volatility is risk. I don't think so. I think that the important risk is uh, the, the two most important risks are, number one, the, the risk of permanent impairment of capital or the risk of not taking enough risk and underperforming. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we care so much about volatility. And, of course, a lot of performance is evaluated based on the Sharpe ratio, which is essentially the relationship we, between return and volatility. But why? And Buffett says... I'd rather have a lumpy 15 than a smooth 12. And I say in the memo, if you'd rather have a smooth 12 than a lumpy 15, you got to think about why. Is it for financial reasons or is it for uh, psychological reasons, emotional reasons? Um, but uh, I think that um, th these are the things that shouldn't matter, but I think that th these are the things that that investment committees in particular spend the vast majority of their time discussing. And Howard, why, uh, why do you think, you know, it seems to me there's enormous focus on the short term. Yeah. For, for especially for, yeah. I'm going to say, public stock investors, yeah. um, anybody buying a security. Why is that? I, I, look, we, uh, most of what we do at Brookfield is private equity of some sort or another, mm -hmm. and we own things for a long time. Yeah. So I don't understand the short-term thinking. What's driving that? A, a great question, spanning those two memos, is, is what you just asked. Why so much time on, the, on what doesn't matter? And why, you know, look, why do you spend your time trying to develop a macro framework? Uh, and maybe if more people spent their time thinking about whether a macro framework can be helpful, they would change their behavior. But I think, I think and I, I talk about this in the memo uh, about knowledge, but I think that, um, I think most people think you have to. Most people think it's their job. Most people think it would be unprofessional or irresponsible uh, to not 
uh, hi hi hypothesize about the rate of growth in the economy and uh, the uh, level of inflation and the outlook for rates and, and currencies and commodity prices and that kind of thing. And they, they, they consider these things important, but they don't grapple with the question of whether they're knowable. And uh, so, you know, at Oak Tree, what I say is we ignore the <coughs> micro, which is unknowable, and we focus on uh, uh, the macro. We focus on the micro, which is the knowable companies, industries, and securities. And if, you know, this is a value conference, which is predicated on, I think, studying the, the micro. And if you read most value books or speak to Buffett and people like that, they, there's not a word about the macro. Um, uh, if, you, if you work really hard studying companies and industries and securities, I think you can get an edge that you can't get in trying to forecast uh, economies um, and, and, uh, and things like inflation and rates. That sounds like uh, great advice for our uh, younger investors. Yeah. All investors. Okay, let, let's move on to your, uh, one of your, I think your second last memo, Sea Change. Yeah. Um, which you wrote in December. And look, just to give all of you some context, Howard has had an incredibly successful investment career for 53 years. Yeah. Uh, not many of us can say that. And um, you say, the reason I point that out is you say we've only had two sea changes yeah. and we might be in a third one. Yeah. So this is really meaningful. Before we get into specifics, what is a sea change in your mind versus just a normal up and down cycle? A sea change, <clears throat> well, it, it, this is a really important distinction. Uh, um, a sea change is a fundamental change for example, in the environment, where everything is different. The way things work is different. The underlying processes are different. The uh, causal environment is different. And the attitudes are different. And, um, you know, uh, uh, it's really important to distinguish it from a cyclical fluctuation. They th those things come and go. But if you're in a different environment and you could figure it out, and act accordingly, I think it, it could make a big difference. So I talk about two sea changes that I, I've lived through. When I started to work at Citibank in the late 60s, the bank was a devotee of what was called the Nifty 50. Growth investing really was invested, uh, invented uh, and named, uh, I think, in the early 60s. And um, the world fell in love with the so-called Nifty 50 supposedly the 50 best and fastest growing companies in America, where A, nothing wrong could ever happen, and B, as a consequence, there was no price too high. And they said, well, if the P-E ratio seems a little high, just wait a couple of years and the companies will grow into its P-E ratio. So it really doesn't matter. And the, and the real mistake was not owning them. Uh, and there was great unanimity about these companies, which of course is extremely dangerous. And uh, so if you bought the stocks the day I got there in uh, September of 1969 at Citibank, and if you held them for five years firmly, you lost over 90% of your money. 90%? In the best companies in America. For the simple reason that number one, half of them ran into trouble, and number two, the price was just too damn high. And these are stocks that for the most part, we're selling between 60 and 90 times earnings. Uh, you know, uh, IBM, Xerox, Kodak, Polaroid, Merck, Lilly, uh, Avon, Texas Instruments, Hewlett Packard, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, Coca-Cola and so forth. And, uh, and, and, and so uh, that was, that was a, that was a climate in which the job of the investment professional was viewed as buying good things. And by the way, uh, the, the old under the old fiduciary law, if you bought 10 things that were not, not commonly agreed to be good, 
and nine of them made money and one lost a little money, you could be surcharged for having bought that one. If the job of the fiduciary was to buy investment grade bonds, you, you know, you just couldn't buy non-investment grade bonds. That all changed in the, in the important sea change of 1977-78 <coughs> when people, uh, you know, you couldn't issue a bond without an investment grade rating before that time. And Mike Milken and, and others, uh, their great contribution w was to assert that you should be able to issue non-investment grade bonds and you should be able to buy them as a fiduciary intelligently if the promised return is more than ample to offset the risk. And I think it's clear that this has become the way we think today. Nobody says, these are good, these are bad. By the way, Moody's in 1978 <coughs> defined a B-rated bond as follows, fails to possess the characteristics of a desirable investment. Bad, good, nifty 50 good, B-rated bonds bad. So uh, I reached the conclusion that it's not what you buy, it's what you pay. And I think the world reached that conclusion. And today we think about what's the return? What's the risk? Is the return more than compensatory for the risk? That was a big sea change. The second sea change came shortly thereafter because in the 70s we had a bout of inflation uh, in the United States uh, uh, in the mid-teens. Nobody could figure out how to stop it. Uh, and and uh, it, was, it was really a, a dreary, uh, depressing period. Uh, led by two guys called Dr. Gloom and Dr. Doom. Uh, Al Wojnlauer, chief investment officer, uh, chief uh, economist of First Boston, and Henry Kaufman, chief in, uh, uh, economist of uh, Solomon Brothers. And finally, uh, they appointed uh, Paul Volcker as chairman of the Fed. He took interest rates, the Fed funds rate, to 20. That killed off the inflation, killed off the economy, but uh, it, it, it did solve the immediate problem. And um, I got a slip from a bank. I had a loan outstanding at the time, and I got a slip saying the rate on your loan is now 22 and a quarter, <coughs> December of 1980. 40 years later, I was able to borrow money at two and a quarter. And the, the decline of interest rates by 2,000 basis points over those 40 years, in my opinion, was the most important single event in finance over that period. But if you ask most people, what was it? They might say the Big Bang. They might say, uh, you know, the, the, the Black Monday. They might say uh, global financial crisis, lots of things. I think it was the decline of interest rates. And I, we were talking before about, about private equity. I think that most of the money that was made over that period was made because interest rates came down. Most people don't recognize that, but I think that was very important. And after the global financial crisis, of course, the Fed took uh, the Fed funds rate to zero at the beginning of 09, kept it there seven years, which seems to me they overstayed, uh, engaged in QE, uh, <laughs> flooded the economy with, uh, with uh, liquidity. Uh, it, it, it produced the longest economic recovery in history, the longest bull market in history. It made it very easy to raise money, very hard to uh, go, uh, default or go bankrupt. Um, it just, life was easy. As a consequence, the holders of assets were happy, the buyers were eager, the prevailing fear was FOMO, the fear of missing out. Nobody was really afraid of losing money because they couldn't think of a way they could. And um, and of course, interest rates were extremely low. Yield spreads were tight. The prospective return on credit, which is most of what Oak Tree does, <coughs> were the lowest I've ever seen. And if you go back uh, to the beginning of uh, uh, 22, uh, high yield bonds yielded in the, in the fours. Many of them were in the threes. There was one issue in the twos. So we couldn't call them high yield anymore. Um, but think about this environment. This was a great environment for asset owners because uh, you know, uh, uh, the value of an asset we, we value, people think, is the discounted present value of the future cash flows. If you discount at a lower rate, you get a higher present value. That's easy. So it was great for assets. Also, of course, if you own a piece of a business in the longest uh, economic recovery in history, you probably would have had to struggle to lose money. Uh, 
So that, that was another reason why it was great to own assets. And then the other thing is, of course, the cost of capital declined, which was very, very salutary for businesses, but also for people who borrowed uh, uh, in, in the normal course of, of life. So, you know, uh, now what if you, uh, what if you owned assets with borrowed money? That was a double bonus because your asset become worth more, your cost of capital went down. And uh, so I, I don't want to say that the business of private equity was easy in this period, but, but should maybe, I, but maybe it was. Should I be retiring now? You, Is that what well, you're uh, I think it's a chance to quit on top. Uh, <laughs> um, and, 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 and I compared in the memo, I, com I wrote it when I was traveling in Asia in the fall. So uh, I compared it with going to an airport and being on a moving walkway. And uh, you know, if, if, you, if, you, uh, if you stand on the moving walkway, you make reasonable progress. Uh, but if you walk on the moving walkway, then your progress is the sum of uh, your speed of walking ver and the speed at which the walkway moves relative to the ground. So you move fast. Now, you might think you suddenly became a fast walker. So you should understand what's going on in your environment. And I believe that in this period, uh, people didn't understand it. It, it. And I compared the 40-year decline of interest rates, kind of the frog in the water, you know? You put a frog in a pot of boiling water, he jumps out. But if you put him in a pot of cool water and you put on the gas, it, the water heats up and he sits there and dies because he doesn't realize what's happening. And I think that so many people made so much money uh, in that period because of the ease of the environment without recognizing it. It was a massive tailwind. Very good for asset owners and borrowers, very bad for lenders and bargain hunters. And of course, value investing suffered in this period. Um, uh, our uh, returns in distressed debt are not as good as yours. We only have averaged 22% uh, a year gross and 16 net, but we don't use any leverage. So if you can get those kinds of returns, uh, and by the way, and the funds we formed and invested during crises did much better than that. Um, uh, it, it gives you an idea about the bargains we were able to buy over that period. You, you know, because, uh, by the way, we're all value investors. Our job is to buy things for less than they're worth, right? Yes. Okay. What's the hitch? It requires the cooperation of somebody who's willing to sell it for less than it's worth. When do you get that cooperation? Usually in times of panic, we do. So in, in this happy period from 09 through 21, nobody was eager to get out of anything. There was no urgency. Nobody said, I'll get, it, get me out at any price. Uh, nobody had, a, a, people didn't have withdrawals from funds. There was no uh, uh, knife hanging over people's heads. So it was very, very difficult for period for, for bargain hunters. And from 2012 to 2020, I gave a speech entitled, Investing in a Low Return World. But guess what, we're not there anymore. Because now, because of inflation, the Fed, rather than lower rates, has raised rates, has curtailed and to some degree reversed quantitative easing. Now people are really afraid of the recession that may lie ahead. Uh, so the buyers are not so eager and the holders are not so complacent. And, but now, we as credit investors have, have, high, uh, have adequate base rates, decent yield spreads, and attractive total prospect of returns. So this is a major sea change. I'm not saying that rates have come down and are gonna go back up. I'm gonna say they've come down and are basically gonna stay here for a good period of time. Uh, and I've already um, spent a lot of time talking about how much I dislike macro forecasts, but I say in the memo, that I think that the Fed funds rate for the coming years <clears throat> is more likely to be, be averaged between two and four than zero and two. And it was between zero and two for a really long time and that created the environment I'm describing. And so if instead it's between two and four, I think that's a big sea change. And I think that um, a, a, a less easy period in the next five to 10 years will change what works and what doesn't. Howard, uh, my perspective uh, 
from my perspective. We were in a period of time where there was virtually no differentiation between a great company and mm -hmm. a lousy company mm -hmm. uh, in the credit markets. Right. Very little. And uh, before the cr credit crisis, before the GFC, we did quite a bit of, I'm going to call distress for control type of investing, mm. and there has been virtually none of it. Right. None. Exactly. Now, yeah. it's coming back, yeah. I think. Yeah. Sure. Is it possible? I think we'll it see is. more of that? Yes, because I think. Well, look, in my first 30 years in, in high-yield bonds from 78 to 08, the average default rate in the universe was 4% a year. From 2010 to 2019, the average was 2%. And there was only one year in which the default rate got up to the average. There were no years in which it was above average. So, yeah, I mean, look, Cyrus, if you, the, the period I described was a growing economy, declining cost of capital, and, it, and easy, ease of financing. If you could wreck a company in that environment, you deserved uh, to go For into sure. default or bankruptcy, sure. but it was tough because people would just throw money at you to yeah. re to rescue. So I think I think we're we're I think it that you know you started off by saying who here was investing what before the GFC was it? Yeah. You had to be investing before the GFC uh, to have seen different times by definition. It, you know I always imagine that the people who came into the business in the last fourteen years are saying, well, when are we going back to normal? Like 2015 or 2016 or 2017? That was not normal, that was good times. Now, what I thought you were gonna say is who in the room was averaging, uh, was investing uh, before interest rate hit 20 in 1980? Uh, and not so many. Uh, and by the way, the, the, our environment, our business was so horrible in the 70s that you literally couldn't get a job which means that if you were working in the 70s, you probably got your job in the 60s. And there aren't that many of us left. But, but you had to, and so I think, that, I think that the last 40 years were not normal times. They were a period in which interest rates were consistently either declining or low or both. And that's not normal, because rates are usually cycle related. So, uh, and by the way, the 70s weren't normal because they were dominated by the inflation. So I think the 60s were normal, uh, but uh, most people don't have what a was direct the recollection. What was the 10-year treasury in the 60s? Do you remember? Oh, I think it was about five. Okay. Yeah. Kind of feels normal. Feels normal. By the way, uh, in, in 05, 6, 7, I was very worried about the markets. So I had all my money that wasn't at Oak Tree in one, two, three, four, five, six year treasuries, laddered portfolio, dumbest form of investing known to man. And, and I was getting close to six. That's great. And, and today those things pay, uh, you know, uh, two to three, and uh, a year ago they paid a fraction. Okay, I have a couple of more questions, then we're gonna open up to the floor. Um, uh, I think I've got my timing right here. You want shorter answers? But uh, no, no, we're doing great, you're doing great. And this is a little unfair because I, I didn't have a chance to talk to you about this, but AI, artificial intelligence, how is this, in your view, going to impact the investing industry? I wrote a memo six or seven, six or seven years ago called Investing Without People. And I reviewed indexation and, and passive investing, algorithmic and systematic investment, and then AI and machine learning. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I have to start stories at the beginning. So for me, this starts when I was in grad school at the University of Chicago, as you described, and the professor made mention of the fact that the, the average, uh, the vast majority of equity mutual funds uh, did not uh, perform as well as the S&P uh, before fees and, and, of course, even more after fees. And he said, well, why don't they just buy one share of every stock in the S&P? We didn't have the concept of an index fund at the time. Jack Bogle really created that in 74. But, you know, uh, we lived in a dumb world. There wasn't much information. There wasn't much information transfer in the 60s. Uh, and so you could do that. And you could charge high management fees for uh, running a, an equity mutual fund and underperforming the S&P. 
oh, clearly that has changed. The majority of equity mutual fund capital is now run index or passive, uh, and at a fee of a, a, you know, a few basis points. Um, so, you know, this was a weeding out, and one of the things that's supposed to happen in a capitalist system is, is a weeding out. We talked about the fact that one of these days there may be fewer private equity funds. Does the world really need thousands of them? Uh, but, you know, it, 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 we stopped having a condition where you could give inferior performance and charge a high fee for it. Rightly so. Um, and I hasten to point out that, and, and now the majority of capital is run passive index, not because it, it's so good, but because active was so bad. And you shouldn't be able to charge highly for it. Um, now, let's go ahead to, to AI, and, which is in the, in the news big time today. What I was told in college was that what a computer can do is add, subtract, compare, remember. Those are the essential things they do. And that's not a great list. Oh, but they can do them without computational errors. They can handle a lot of data very fast, and they can do it without emotional errors. So now it starts to sound better. And in fact, maybe that's better than most people. So this is why these processes have, have, uh, have turned over to uh, automation. Um, and, you know, the people who were charging high management fees and giving imperial performance shouldn't be in the business or shouldn't be able to get those fees. And now I imagine fewer are. And, and we're, all of us active investors are now held to a higher standard. Um, and that's not going to decline. But the question is, will AI and so forth doom all of us? And I like to believe that the answer is no, because I like to believe that there are some things that we can do, the, that the best investors can do, that others can't do. Uh, and uh, the examples I give are, can a computer sit down with five business plans and figure out which one of them is going to be Amazon? Can a computer sit down with five CEOs and figure out which one of them is going to be Steve Jobs? And in our own world, can, 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 a, uh, can a computer sit down with the records of a bankruptcy proceeding and figure out how the company's going to be restructured? And uh, I think not. So I think, that, I think that AI and so forth will not be able to deal with qualitative and uh, uh, future-oriented. By definition, uh, AI and machine learning know everything about the past. And they can figure out what has worked in the past. But I don't think they know everything about the future. And some small number of investors, I think, will, will be able to do that uh, in a more satisfactory way. OK, so the good news is maybe I don't need to retire. I and, think that's uh, right. We're going we're gonna to move on now and take some questions uh, from the floor. George. Yeah. So, in the recession down from 1980 to now, this led to a, a business of ours. Why this went down? Because it's less of a down. Yeah. Do you have a view or an idea why it's less of a down? And has the environment changed going forward that may cause a reversal? Okay, so rates went down over that period. Largely because inflation was uh, declined and, uh, and was quiescent for a long time. And is, that, is the outlook for that changing? Um, yes, it, w clearly the 20% interest rates was just like a, a dose of medicine uh, designed to solve the problem, and it did. The, the, uh, the inflation, uh, inflation's kind of mysterious. I, I would not say we know where, how it starts. We don't know. We, for a long time, we didn't know how it stops. Uh, you know, we, we, we found this thing called the Phillips curve, which relates inflation to the level of, of unemployment. 
but then you know in the in the last decade we had declining unemployment and no inflation so it's not predictable the inflation in the 70s uh, was really kicked off by the uh, uh, OPEC oil embargo um, which got people thinking about price increases uh, and uh, it, it caused pro uh, inflationary expectations to be embodied in psychology and once it gets in there it's hard to get out. So in, uh, inflationary expectations are self-fulfilling because if you believe that the price of something will be higher uh, a year from now than it is today then you'll buy it today which will put the price up today or, uh, or you'll invest or, or, or something like that. So it is self-fulfilling and, and uh, then Volcker broke the back of, of it and we didn't see it for uh, there was one bout in, in the teens but other than that we didn't see it for, for, for 40 years. Um, I think that um, the, the, the world economies are actually growing slower now which should be less inflationary uh, than, than in the past. Um, on the other hand we, we are missing the salutary impact of forces such as globalization and you know, uh, in one of my memos, I showed a table where I showed that the prices of consumer durables uh, had declined by 25% in real terms. Uh, no, 40% over a 25-year period. As I recall, the period was uh, 1990 to uh, 2005 to 15, which of course coincides with the offshoring of jobs and the uh, sourcing from first uh, China, uh, first Japan actually, of course, then China. And then and and now other countries like Bangladesh and uh, and so forth, um, and uh, I if if I think that if you weight it, the decline of forty percent in the prices of durables took about three quarters of a percent off the rate of inflation. So if we if we don't have the same benefits from globalization, then you just add on that other things. You know there'll be pluses and minuses. Uh, we're now onshoring, and clearly it. it costs more to produce m most things in this country, uh, certainly technical things, uh, small work, uh, than, it, than, it, than it did. So, uh, you know, that, that the, all else being equal, if you want to take it, make a neutral forecast, you take the prevailing rate of interest and you add 0.75. Uh, and, uh, and I'm sure that's wrong. Uh, but, um, but uh, you know, we, you just would have to be an optimist to expect the inflation to be uh, as, as quiescent as it has been. Next question. Uh, hey, Howard. Uh, quick question. How would you advise uh, your son, who's a VC, to invest in this new sea change? Um, well, uh, I think it's, it's not relevant to him. Um, by the way, I would suggest that he invest carefully. Uh, you know, look, he, he, he came out of, the period I'm talking about is 09 through 21. Guess when he came out of college? 09. This was a great period for expansiveness, imagination, creativity, uh, uh, entrepreneurship, startups, availability capital, etc. Again, it wasn't a normal period. You have to understand the environment you're in and have been in. And so, you know, you have to be very careful. Uh, but the other thing is I would recommend that, that he be lucky. And uh, he, he, uh, he had a small fund, just his money and his partners. Then he brought it in friends and family, did very well with that. And then, guess what? Last February, he raised a large amount of money and he didn't spend it. So he, he was lucky, which I always recommend, good luck. Um, <laughs> but you know, the, the, you, you, you can't, look, 97, 98, 99, 2000, venture capital was going crazy and, and making money like crazy and the people who invested were making money. I think as I recall that, that uh, uh, Duke uh, in fiscal 2000 made 350% in its venture portfolio and as a consequence its whole endowment was up 28%, uh, which is exactly the moment when I took over at, uh, chairing the investment committee at Penn um, July the 1st of, of uh, 2000. Penn did not, Penn was uh, led by a guy named John Neff who was literally the Warren Buffett of the, 
of the 70s. And uh, Warren Buffett was not the Warren Buffett of the 70s. But, but Neff was a deep value guy. So all Penn had was deep value stocks. We had deep value large stocks, deep value small stocks, deep value foreign stocks. But we didn't have any tech, any growth, any venture, any buyouts. And so in fiscal 2000, Duke made 28%. Penn, I think, probably lost two or something like that. Um, so, you know, that, it was a boom, great boom. And, but what happened? The, the, the typical venture fund had been, let's say, 100 million. I don't know if that was the right figure, but I think that was close. And then in 01, of course, they could raise 2 billion. And nothing kills returns uh, more than too much money. And fast forward five, six, seven, eight years, I, people were calling me saying, do you think venture capital is still an asset class? Do you think we'll ever see another new venture fund? Because they did so badly. But one thing we have to, you know, so I, Cyrus mentioned that my 2018 book was called the, the uh, Mastering the Market Cycle. And the last chapter is, is entitled the, the Cycle in Success. Because success is cyclical. I mean, it doesn't have, it, it's not only cyclical, but cyclical influences pay a big influence in cycles. And you have to remember that success carries within itself the seeds of failure. Failure carries within itself the seeds of success. And so when, when venture did too well, it attracted too much money, uh, which caused it to fail. Then the failure meant you couldn't raise much money. So the little bit of money that could be raised was invested without much com competition to invest and did very well. But then it attracted too much money. And, and so the cycle, cycles are never ending. And uh, so you have to be cognizant of the environment you're in. And um, it, there's, there's few things as dangerous as being in an environment where there's too much money around and people are too eager to put it to work. So I think, he's, I think my son has heard that lecture before. Uh, next question, please. Hi, Mr. Marks. Uh, you spoke a bit about behavioral biases today. You've written about them in the past. I wondered if you could comment on what behavioral bias you think you have struggled with the most over your career and what uh, sure. frameworks, mental models you've put in place or tried to put in place to try and uh, mitigate or control that bias. Sure. Um, well, first of all, when you say Mr. Marks, uh, somebody told me yesterday that he had sent me an email uh, addressed Mr. Marks, I said, oh, I forwarded it to my father. Uh, but, um, you know, my, who here, their, whose parents were alive during the Depression? Few hands, okay. Whose parents were adults during the Depression? Like mine. And, you know, my, my, my parents were born in the, in, in the first decade of the 20th century, which meant they were adults during the Depression. And so if your parents were uh, adults during the Depression, what did you learn? Don't put all your eggs in one basket, save for a rainy day, and worry like crazy. My father was the world's champion pessimist. And, and I would say that I have been too conservative in my life. Uh, uh, you know, and uh, uh, kind of chicken. Now, that made it good for me because when I went into these new oddball asset classes like convertible bonds, high yield bonds, distressed debt, and emerging market equities and things like that, uh, I, I was able to espouse and convince people that we would take a conservative approach to a risky asset class, which was successful. However, uh, I, think that, I think that when we set up the culture at Oak Tree, we probably made it too risk averse, and that's not good. So I think we try to be a little more expansive today, but it's, it's hard to change your, your personality. Uh, for many of us, the best you can do is be aware of your biases. Another question? Thanks for taking my question. Um, Howard, you talked about the comment from Warren Buffett about the preferring the lumpy 15% to the smooth 12. I'm curious your thoughts on volatility and just some context on that. You know, I don't disagree with 
Warren Buffett very often, but I would argue I'd take the fixed 12 over the lumpy 15 because definitionally that, depending on how volatile it is, that, that 15 might go to 20 or 25 later and I could sell my fixed 12 and buy the 25. So at a value investing conference, I know a lot of people say volatility doesn't matter and it's just uh, asset impairment, but I'm sure you've thought a lot about it and I, th I, I think volatility does matter, so I'm curious your thoughts. I think that the main reason volatility matters is because, uh, because of the realities of the, of the people whose money it is. And, uh, you know, it's easy for the investment manager to say volatility doesn't matter. But, by the way, so I was talking about my experience at Penn. And uh, when Penn asked me if I would take the job July 1st of 2000, I said I will. But, uh, you know, I'm not going to jump on the bandwagon of tech and, and, and venture uh, and, and ride the bandwagon off the cliff. So I'm not going to change it overnight, and we, and we didn't. And uh, so we had a rather cautious portfolio going into uh, the global financial crisis and did, and did, uh, and did very well. Um, other, uh, other institutions, other endowments that went for the, shall we say, the lumpy 15, uh, had to freeze hiring, freeze wages, freeze construction, uh, maybe sell uh, closed-end funds at a discount to NEV, borrow money, uh, often in the taxable bond market. So the realities of one's existence can, can mean that volatility has some importance. So you can never ig ignore your, uh, the, the conditions under which you, you work. Um, one of my favorite sayings is that uh, never forget the person who was six feet tall who drowned crossing the stream that was five feet deep on average. The idea of surviving on average is irrelevant. You have to survive every day, which means you have to survive on the bad days. Silicon Valley Bank really was not fundamentally insolvent. It was insolvent at a moment in time. It happens that at that moment, people ask for their money back. And it couldn't give it to them. So I would say that um, it's important to keep the realities in mind. Um, and uh, by the way, as to Buffett's uh, lumpy 15, uh, there's a book out called The Warren Buffett Way. And I was asked to write the preface for the recent edition. And I wrote, it, I wrote something called What Makes Warren Buffett Warren Buffett? And I list the, th the things about him. High degree of intelligence, quick study, figures out what's important, ignores what's not important, uh, sticks to a few things, uh, doesn't feel he has to invest in everything that comes along, uh, high degree of patience, uh, willing to sit on his hands for a long time. But you know what the last one was? Can't get fired. And people who can't get fired have a much greater ability to ignore volatility than the people who can. So uh, realities. Now your, your uh, argument that if you put your money into the safe 12, y you'll be able to uh, pull it out and go into the things that used to pay 15 when they get up to 25 is a good argument. The only thing is the thing that pays 12 will only, uh, will only be selling at 80 cents on the dollar uh, in that climate, so you may not feel like doing it. But, uh, you know, it's, it's clearly uh, not realistic to say we can completely ignore volatility. I just think, I just think that concern with volatility is overdone. Uh, the greatest thing you can do is, is, get, is build a relationship with your clients that permits you to take more volatility than otherwise. And I think that, uh, you know, I spend a lot of time trying to build relationships with clients because you have to have the meeting of the minds. And if you don't share expectations, and if you don't share an understanding of the realities, then you can't have a successful relationship for long. Okay, I think we have time for one more uh, at the back there. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you for taking my question. Howard, just a quick um, question. Just want to see if we can reconcile this because, you know, at a value investing conference, right, uh, I'm just thinking about the market as a whole, uh, the S&P 500 trading around 18 times PE or about a 5.5% earnings yield with inflation running, <clears throat> excuse me, between 5 and 7%. In this new environment, the sea change, I just want to know how you reconcile that. In other words, is just the market excessively expensive? Is it some, we're not trying to predict the future, but just looking at the valuation in terms of the market and investing over the next few years. Just want to know how you reconcile that. In other words, you're getting a 5.5% earnings yield in an environment where it doesn't even beat inflation. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that. I think that, uh, you know, uh, I guess what I would say is that the, right, over the last year, the optimists have been winning the tug of war. And the optimists think that inflation is going to cool off and permit the Fed to, to pivot uh, soon. Uh, and uh, we're going to go back to that version of normal, uh, which I don't happen to agree with. So I think that the, I think that the market's uh, somewhat overvalued, not criminally. Uh, it's a little overvalued, you know. The P/E ratio is 19, maybe on the S&P 500. The post-war average is 16. Uh, if, if, if today's no interest rates are normal, and then then uh, that should be uh, coincident with a normal P/E of 16. It's 19. It's 20 percent overvalued. Uh, I, I don't I don't think you can argue that it's crazy overvalued. You know, in 2000 it was 32. Uh, but it's certainly not undervalued. And, uh, you know, look, I believe that there's probably a period of adjustment uh, ahead for the S&P, uh, but uh, I, don't, I don't see a, a huge collapse, just a readjustment uh, to this new environment, which hasn't taken place yet. Hi, Howard. Um, you've written a few memos over time on cryptocurrency. Um, and your views have evolved. I just wanted to get, as a final take, what your current thinking is. Thanks. You know, um, 87, I read a good uh, uh, article which introduced me to the idea of this time it's, it's not any different. You know, people in the investment business uh, always say, well, that, you know, that now it's different, which means that the past is irrelevant and the rules of thumb which obtained in the past uh, don't matter. Uh, and people, and usually people get into trouble when they say this time it's different. Of course, you know, Bitcoin and crypto are manifestations of this time it's different. Uh, however, in that article, it was October the 11th of 87, uh, John Templeton, who I think really raised that discussion of this time it's different, uh, said, but remember, 20% of the time it is different. And in, in, the, in today's day and age, with technology uh, so uh, ubiquitous and the gains so rapid, I would, I would think it's more than 20% of the time uh, that, that, it, that things are different. Um, now, crypto is, uh, you know, I, I, uh, the first time I ever discussed it in a memo was in uh, 17. I think it was a memo called There They Go Again, because you know, in, in, in good times, imagine, as I said before, imagination takes flight. And I was listing several things that I thought were indicative of the fact that we were in a high risk environment, one of which was the success of crypto. And I said, that there's, no, there's nothing there. There has no core. It's not exchangeable for anything. There's nothing behind it. Um, there's nothing to it. It's, it, 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 it's, it's not a, something that you can in, invest in intelligently. Uh, I think, I think I was uh, too dismissive. Uh, of course, I lived with my son and his family for the first three months of the pandemic. I got beat up daily on the subject. Um, and, uh, he, and my son made a pretty good point. He says, how can you talk about things you don't know anything about? <laughs> point, point taken. So I try, I try to avoid doing that now. Uh, but you know what? Crypto is something that is incomprehensible f for most members of my generation and clear as day for most members of his. 
and uh, you know, we don't need crypto in this country. You don't see it around. But what about a country where you can't get to the bank, you don't trust the bank, uh, you don't want the, any, any record of whether you have money, you don't want the government to know that you have money uh, because you're afraid they'll come take it away, uh, some despot. Uh, maybe it does play a role. And so um, uh, I'm, I'm less uh, doctrinaire about it today and, uh, <clears throat> and certainly not dismissive. And it's worth noting, by the way, that crypto, uh, Bitcoin, is like 14 years old now. And Andrew insists that most scams don't l l last 14 years, but of course Madoff did. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, you know, Bitcoin is is famous for having fallen 80 percent from its high, but it's almost double this year, I think, maybe double. And you know, when he bought it in March of 20, because he thought it would benefit from the pandemic, it was 5,000, and now it's 30. So uh, I certainly don't have the ability to tell him he's all wet. Um, and uh, you know, th there, since I don't believe I have a crystal ball about almost anything, uh, I end a lot of answers the same way, and I'll give you that here. We'll see. Well, uh, Howard, uh, Cyrus, uh, thank you so much for taking time of your busy schedule to come and... Pleasure.